uh, it was kind of interesting. They, they started their building project, but they, they went further than they had intended to. I think because of everybody's generosity, I don't know. So we'll let these pictures kind of tell the story. They, some of them have dates. This is all in a week's time. Yeah, okay. and put it into the new one. That's this morning for them. Wow. Amen. There you go. That's Amen. the last one. Yeah. So that's, they're feeling pretty eager, and uh, they went and launched their goal higher than it originally was. And uh, we'll just see how the Lord unfolds that, because they... Uh, the normal way is you count the cost and you build a building according to what you've planned, but I think they felt so blessed they decided to launch into the zone of faith and step out and they started building beyond what they could uh, ask or imagine. So we'll see how that pans out as, as the weeks and months go by. I'm very excited that ACORN has had the opportunity to bless some people on the other side of the planet. It's just an amazing, amazing time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for those gathered here. I love you, Lord. I thank you for your word. It is so powerful. God, your mercy, it exceeds everything that I could ever ask or imagine. Your love, while we were yet sinners, is immense. It's unfathomable. It's something hard to grasp the way you love. God, I thank you for your provision, your grace, how you equip your people, that you take what is weak and you make it strong. You, you take what is resistant and you make it uh, surrender. Father, I love the way that you carve our path, that you place a dream in our hearts that may not have even been there, that, Lord, you are the creator and you haven't ceased to create, that you penetrate into our minds, our hearts, our thoughts, and you do magnificent things. I thank you, God, that you are the healer, that you are still in the business of healing, Amen. not only healing broken hearts, but broken bones and broken lives and broken dreams and all kinds of wounds of life that this journey can put on us. Yeah. Lord, that we run to you like little kids, just asking for you to help us with our boo-boos. And yet, uh, Father, you are so much more powerful than the fathers that we've had. You are capable and equipped, and you know the timing and the perfect way to do things. You know sometimes when to leave our wounds there for a while so that we can be built up and strengthened and our character can be molded. And other times, Father, you heal us quickly because you understand timing. We don't. We don't also really understand why when we ask for some things we don't see them manifest in the timing that we want and other times we pray for things and they happen just moments later we don't get it and yet we trust in you father because you have that foreknowledge you have that ability to see all the past and all the future you are the alpha and the omega you are the beginning and the end and we've learned to trust in you and to be comforted in you and and just to understand that once we give it to you, that it's safe there, yeah. that we are protected by you, that you are our strong tower, and that you deflect all the fiery darts of the evil one. I thank you, Father, that you are greater than darkness, that you are the light and you penetrate the darkness. Yeah. I thank you, God, that you are the victor, mm -hmm. that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and there are none that can stand against you. I thank you, Lord, that we worship you because you are worthy of our worship. Nothing else is. Nothing else can claim that place and be the center of our lives. Thank you for Jesus, for the blood of Jesus. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
So this morning I want to preach a topic that I must say has been difficult for me. Not because it's a difficult topic, it's just a lot of stuff to put into one segment of time and hope that people can grasp what is being taught. And I thought, I told Richard I should have just written a book and asked people to buy the book instead. <laughs> so if it falls short today, I give my apologies in advance and I will do my best to surrender to his spirit. And it's going to move uh, quickly for some and probably slow for others. But I want to start in a passage in Exodus chapter 4. Exodus 4.10. And I want to talk today about Moses and Aaron and their call and the things they experienced and the challenges. And I hope that somehow you'll relate them to your own life and how that God is calling you and there are challenges and bumps and enemies even in the road. And yet... When God is for you, no one can be against you. Amen. When God has tapped into your life and tapped you on the shoulder and you have responded, because God is calling everybody, but when it's come to that point in your life where you are surrendering and you're letting God captivate you, I want you to understand that he puts you into a tent, a canopy of protection through the power of his Holy Spirit that will keep you from any failure that is unnecessary. He will protect you. It's not to mean that you won't be hurt, that you won't experience pain, you won't endure some kind of trial or persecution, but it means that he has put you under the shield of his protection yeah. your whole workforce can be speaking evil against you your your body can be falling apart your mind could be failing you any number of things your finances could be troubling you your your management skills could be waning your 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 vision can be crumbling and yet if you're under the protection of God nothing can stand against you Amen. and so I'm hoping that you'll get a piece of this from Moses a little bit because Moses was a human and Moses was sinful. And we don't like to think of our heroes that way, but he too was a man like you and I. And when God called Moses, Moses wasn't really up for the task. And I want to show you that. In Moses, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. What's happening here is Moses is presenting his case before God why he does not want to do what God has asked him to do. Have you ever been there? <laughs> I've certainly been there many times and in some places of my life many years where I sat on the sideline because I didn't want to do what God wanted me to do. And I built excuses. I built reasons to resist what Lord wanted for me. In verse 11, the Lord said to him, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. So what Moses has done is he began to list his, his disqualifications. He stood up before God and he said, God, I can't speak well enough. God, I'm not the one for this journey that you have. I'm not equipped. And God retorts with, I'm the creator of the universe, Moses. If you have a speaking problem, do you think I'm not incapable? If I, 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 do you think that I can't just change that for you? If you have a problem seeing, do you think I can't give you vision and discernment? But Moses said, oh Lord, please send someone else to do it. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. And he said, well, what about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, by the way. And his heart will be glad when he sees you. <laughs> God's foreknowledge. <laughs> God already knew he's going to have this discussion with Moses. Yeah. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth, and as if you were his God. But take this staff in your hand, so that you can perform miraculous signs with it. 
You know, the staff, we read a verse here, Mike read it about thy rod and thy staff will comfort me. And the staff has a great role in the Bible about how uh, the shepherd uses it. The shepherd uses a staff with that hook on the end to kind of keep those sheep in the right path. And sometimes the staff is a weapon and sometimes it's a prodding uh, device. Sometimes it's something to pull you back. But the staff all through the Bible has a symbol of leadership. It's a scepter, you know, in a king's hand at times. The staff is a rod. The staff is that switch that your parents tell you to tear off the tree and give you a couple lickings for sometimes. The Bible says in Proverbs 26.3, a whip for the horse and a bridle for the donkey and a rod for the back of fools. And so, you know, the staffs have all kinds of pictures for us, but today we're going to focus on one, and that is the blossoming rod of Aaron. And some of you know the story is Rod blossoms miraculously. When his leadership has been challenged, and we're going to talk about this trial that they go through, God says, I want everybody in, from every tribe to select their leader, and I want them to get a rod and to take that almond branch and set it before me in the holy place. And tomorrow, go check on your rods. And when they go check on the rods and they pull out Aaron's, which had been a dry stick from, from years before, is suddenly budding, flowering, and producing almonds. Something that was dead has come to life. And not only was what was dead coming to life, it was in all stages of fruitful production. It was producing fruit on all ends. It was very evident at the point that that happened, the tribes, the, the, the way they respond, and maybe we'll get a chance to see this passage in, in Numbers chapter 17, I'm not too sure, but it says that when they saw what had happened and they saw that Aaron's rod had done these things, they said, woe are we, we will die! Because they realized that the rebellion that they had put against his leadership had huge consequences. What's the significance, I wonder, of an almond branch. Anybody know? Anywhere else in the Bible you think of almond branches? The, the dove carried the olives. No, 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 we're not. Not olives. Almonds. Go for it. Us. Okay. We might be the almond branch. Possibly. That's olive that was a wild olive shoot too. We're dealing with almonds. I thought maybe I'd bring this big bag of almonds today. I actually bought them. I went to Aldi's and I bought <laughs> almonds. I got some cocoa flavored ones and some sea salt flavor oh, flavored God. ones. Yeah. And I started eating them. They were both good. And I was going to put them like in a vase or something and pass them. Then I thought, ah, that whole germ thing. Darn it. So I didn't bring them. But they're at the house. They're at the house. And if you come next Friday for our potluck, you can not only see the house, but you can taste the almonds. Amen. <laughs> Some people are looking forward to that. That's good. So you remember when you go into the holy, I know that we didn't go, but we've studied the scriptures a little bit, some of us, and, and you get into the holy place and you walk into the tabernacle and you look to the right and there's the table of showbread that, that the priest has prepared. But on your left is the candelabra. And if you remember, when the Bible talks about how the candelabra was built, it's to be built like an almond tree with branches and knops and the uh, beautiful blossoms of an almond tree. And so you could do your research and find out if I'm telling the truth or not, Exodus chapter 25. So it was a symbol of the light of the Lord. It was the symbol of God's anointing. It was a symbol of the oil that would be burning there and that would be a representation of, of God's burning spirit that was never to go out. It had much picturesque meaning in the nation of Israel to this point. What is their symbol? It's, it, it's that candle. It's all about that candelabra and, and the menorah and, and, and that God provides. And so it's a, a very deeply embedded symbol. And it has another meaning that comes out in Jeremiah. When Jeremiah was a young prophet and the Lord was trying to work with him and trying to teach him how to hear the Lord's voice. He says, Jeremiah, uh, you've got a vision. What do you see? And Jeremiah says, I see an olive branch. I mean, an almond branch. Sorry, I did it. An almond branch. And moreover, Jeremiah tells us, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And 
I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am always watching, ready to perform my word. And so in Hebrew, there's a play on words here because the word for watching and the word for almond is exactly the same. Okay. And so the reason that that came to be, they think, is because the almond blossoms come first. And if you watch for the almond blossoms, then you know that the next season of harvest is coming. And so God is the watcher, and he tells them, I'm always watching and ready to perform my word. So there's lots of symbolism that happens when Aaron's rod blossoms. But why did we need this? Why did it all happen? Well, uh, uh, another question is, when we think of the sacred times of the ancient tribes of Israel, they would go around carrying this thing they called the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant was the covenant. It was what God had established as a contract between God and with his people. But there were two other sacred items that were put into the box and they were the manna that God supplied in the wilderness to show that God would supply even in a desert, even in the difficult times, even in a place where there was nothing to eat. He would supply the sustenance for survival. And there was the rod. He said, I want you to store up Aaron's rod so that Israel will always remember not to rebel against me. Because the rebellion against Aaron was not a rebellion against Aaron. It was a rebellion against everything that God represented. If you remember, when we look at these scriptures, Moses, and we'll also find out Aaron, resisted leadership. They actually didn't want leadership. But it was because of God's command. It was because of God's instruction. It was because God was calling them to do something that they did it. It wasn't something that they climbed some ladder to get for themselves. It wasn't about exalting Moses or Aaron. It wasn't about the spotlight that they might get from leadership. It was obedience to God. And a matter of fact, their first instinct in the flesh was, I do not want to obey you, Lord. And so when the people began to rise up against Moses and Aaron and their leadership, Moses and Aaron... In one side, we don't hear the scripture say that, but they probably were saying deep down inside, I wish it were you. <laughs> but instead, they, they took it personal, and, and, and I can see it in a way as, as Moses begins to obey God, and, and they begin the journey, and they see God deliver him from Pharaoh and the victories. There are times in Moses' journey where he's like, God, take these people. I didn't ask for them. And then there's other times when God says, step back, Moses, I'm going to destroy him. And Moses is like, no, 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 don't destroy him. God, uh, scratch my name from the book of life. And so it's an interesting journey between this, this uh, man who wanted to resist the calling to a man that at other times wants to embrace it with all his heart. And so we've come to this point where God has done all these miracles in their lives and they get out into the wilderness and one of the tribes, which is the tribe of Levi, begins to resist Moses' and Aaron's leadership. Mm -hmm. They're actually people uh, in the same family. You know, Israel's developed into 12 tribes. And I got this slide just for fun and I, I wanted to use my laser pointer. So here we go. Woo, look at that. Here's Levi, the tribe of Levi. That's the priestly tribe. He has three sons, the Gershonites, the Kohathites, and the Merarites, okay? And through the Kohathites comes Amram and Jacobed and Aaron and Elizabeth. Oh, all the way down here. Finished. But this guy, Moses and Aaron. And so God gives Moses the leadership, but he gives Aaron the priesthood, okay? But then in the same family, because we're in that one side of the Levite tribe right here in this side, he gives this guy Korah part of the lineage, and so this guy, Korah, which would be, yeah, a cousin to Moses, he begins to talk. And so that's where we're going. Number 16. Number 16, verse 1. Number 16, 1. Korah, son of Ishar, the son of 
Kohath, the son of Levi, and certain Reubenites. Now that's right outside of the tribe of Levi, Reubenites. Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, and On, son of Peleth, became insolent and rose up against Moses. With them were 250 Israelite men, well-known community leaders who had been appointed members of the council. So not only has... Korah got some of the guys from the camp of Reuben, but he's basically got the top leadership. He's got 250 guys in the leadership uh, of, of the massive amount of people that are out there in the wilderness. And he says to them, they came as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far. The whole community is holy, every one of them. And the Lord is with them. Why then do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly? And so Moses and Aaron are all of a sudden confronted by those they love and are endeared to the most. They're confronted by their own like family. And their own family saying, who made you so high and holy that you think that you should be leading us? And this is the guy who didn't want to lead. This is the guy that actually didn't want the job. At this point, it would have been kind of convenient for Moses to say, hey, here's my staff, dude, and take over. Have it. But at this point, no, Moses is actually hurt. He's taken ownership of the calling that God has put on his life. Now, I want you to get something straight here as I'm entering in. Actually, let me read to the verse that it'll make it more sense. So, when Moses heard this, he fell face down. Then he said to Korah and all his followers, In the morning, the Lord will show who belongs to him and who is holy. And he will have that person come near to him. The man he chooses will cause to come near him. You, Korah, and all your followers are to do this. Take censers and tomorrow put fire and incense in them before the Lord. The man the Lord chooses will be the one who is holy. You Levites have gone too far. So Korah says, you know, who are you, Moses, to set yourself up? And in reality, it's a good question. Because Moses is no better than anybody else. And in reality, what Korah says is true. We're all holy. We're all part of God's camp. It's even more true. It's, it's like prophetic of the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, we only have one mediator between God and men. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, we only have one great high priest. And it's not Aaron and it's not a man. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's our God robed in flesh. Come down for you so that he could be the high priest. The whole book of Hebrews is about it. So we don't have a, we don't, I'm not a priest. My family is not the priesthood. And a matter of fact, if we're going to deal with trying to take the title of priest, all of you are priests. Because the Bible teaches in, Roman, uh, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6 and also in, in, in Peter that we, when we come into Christ, have been welcomed into the priesthood of Christ. That we all become priests and kings in Christ. And that we all become interceders offering our incense of prayer unto God on behalf of the souls of the lost. Amen. And so when you see a, a random person baptize someone and you go, well, they're not a priest. They can't do that. Hogwash. Every one of you should be baptizing people. Amen. I, I rejoice in the day when you come to me one day and you go, Jeff, I, 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 I hope it's okay. I, I baptized my friend I've been studying with and he just was seeking you and, and he's here with us today and his name is Bob and we, 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 we already did the stuff. I'm like, yeah, you go, do it. And we'll grow and we'll be sloppy and we'll make mistakes as we grow in our priesthood. But if you make me a priest then you've already stepped off the plane. That's because you don't have the beads. I don't have the beads. I don't, you don't have the white collar. I, I don't have that. You know, in the New Testament, there's, there's that, that's just not there, guys. And sometimes you hear me say, I, I don't really like the term pastor. And I don't. And this is why. Because a lot of people just use the term pastor for priest. Okay? The word pastor is in Ephesians chapter 4. But the Greek word used there is shepherd. 
Okay. And so it's only a word that is translated a little bit differently in one verse of the entire Bible, but in the older archaic languages, the term pastor meant elder or shepherd. Okay. And so my role is a public speaker, as a preacher, as an evangelist, as somebody who would lead you and guide you is shepherd-like, not priest-like. And there's a big difference. And that's why I avoid the term pastor, because it's evolved in the English language to mean something that is not biblically correct. And if you've stuck around me long enough, I'm more interested in make it to heaven and what the Bible says than what everybody else says. That's, that's, that's at the end of the game, show it to me in here, and I'm going to make my heart soft and receive it. Okay, so that's why, commercial-wise, I don't do that. We're all priests. You know, if you can make me a priest, you can be lazy. If you make me a priest, then you all can not do your evangelistic work. If you make me the one responsible, then that makes you not responsible. And the fact of the matter is, God called us all to be disciples and to go make disciples. Yeah. And so it's a level playing field. That's why Paul can say, there is neither male nor female. There's neither Greek nor Jew. There's neither slave nor free. Because in Christ, we're all equal. Amen. And so my calling is your calling. But here he is, Korah, kind of a man out of his time. Because in Korah's case, that wasn't the case. God had exalted a man to do the job. In Korah's case, God had hand-selected Moses and Aaron to do this, to be mediators for a nation and roll their sins ahead so that one day God could atone for the sins of all mankind through his son. God had a plan. He had ordained a specific way for things to happen, and Korah was interrupting the plan of God. Because he's like, oh, we can all do this. These tribes, the Gershonites, the Kohathites, the Merarites, I wanted to read this to you. The Gershonites were responsible for the coverings, the curtains, and the ropes of the tabernacle. The Kohathites were responsible for all the items of the tabernacle, the altar, the table, the lamp, the stand, the ark. Remember, that tabernacle was moving all over the place. Yeah. And the Merarites were to take care of the frames, the crossbars, the posts, the vases, the tent pegs, etc. Each had their job, and if you mixed your job in those times, you died. And when it came to Aaron and his sons, they would use the veil to cover the ark. Only Aaron and his sons would take the holy veil that separated from the holy place to the most holies, and they would cover the ark with the veil. And then the Kohathites could step forward and move the ark. If you did it any other way, you died. This is the only way you could do it. Nothing else. Strange fire. Not acceptable. God had a specific way and a specific order. So when Korah steps up and he says, I don't like this order and I don't like this way, he's not speaking against Moses and Aaron, though he thinks he is. He's speaking against the directives of God. Moses received on the mount what he was supposed to do. When Moses came down from the mount, he came down with the covenant. And so when Korah speaks, what he's saying is, I don't believe what you wrote on the mount. I don't believe what's written in the, in the covenant. I don't believe what you say God told you, Moses. We're all holy. We're all people of God, and we can all do this. Yeah. And that's pretty rough. That's pretty rough. Moses goes on to say, hey, everybody do a priestly thing then. Get a censer. This is something priests do every day. Get yourself a burning sensor. Now, they had these anyway. They keep the hot coals in them to keep their fires burning in their own cooking uh, ovens and stuff. They didn't have electricity like us, so everybody had their little burning sensors that they'd have. It reminds me of those, this, uh, uh, when I went to the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where Jesus apparently was buried, and a big Catholic church sits over it, and the priests would, would have these chained... Um, pots and, and they would have the incense burning them and they'd walk down the, as they did the procession of their, their things and the incense would fill the room and it was pretty amazing but that's kind of what I picture. I picture all these guys coming with their pots and their, their, their something to carry them so their hands don't get burned and, the, and they're going to offer them up to the God and, and, and we know from another story that when you offer strange fire to God you actually get killed. Aaron's own sons 
His first two oldest sons in the establishment of the tabernacle offered strange fire. They, they twisted what God's instructions were and fire reached out from the altar and killed them right on the spot. Aaron's sons, these sons were qualified. They were qualified to do the job, but they were not doing it the way God instructed. And so God zapped them dead on the moment. And they were able to do the job. And so Moses is saying, I propose that we all go do what Aaron, his sons, were qualified to do. And we're all going to go up and we're going to do, we're going to offer this fire unto God. And we're going to see who God approves. The way that Moses says it, the Lord will show who belongs to him. And that's cool. I mean, our God is so awesome. You can be in the midst of persecution, be in the midst of frustration, but at the end of the day, you don't even have to defend yourself because God will show whose are his. You know, in the New Testament, Paul uses this quote when he uh, speaks to Timothy and he's raising up a young leader and he's telling them about these false doctrines. He's telling them about these guys whose words and teachings are spreading like gangrene. He says, like cancer. It's like a, a disease. What they're speaking, it's infecting people. And Paul says, these people are faith destroyers. They destroy people's faith. This is from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And, he, and they're full of godless chatter. Blah, 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 blah. All the time unproductive words that have no life in them. Their names were Hymenaeus. He even names them Hymenaeus and Philetus. And in the end, he lets Timothy know. He says, however, God's firm foundation stands having this seal. And he quotes this passage that we've been looking at in Numbers chapters 16, 17. 16. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from unrighteousness. Amen. That's going to come later in the, the number 16, the, the second pack of the sentence. But so basically, Paul correlates rebellion and false doctrine and, and, and people that would infiltrate and try to disrupt the true teaching of God. He equates them back to Korah's rebellion. And it, it becomes kind of the method for the apostles. Even Jude spends a quantity of time in, in most of his letter. And he, he, Jude, I, I'll read it to you. I kind of busted out some parts. So uh, it, I'm going through from Jude 4 to Jude 16. But I'm, again, I'm, I'm cutting a, a few words just to keep it a little shorter. He says, For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for sin and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. On the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, they reject authority, and they heap abuse on celestial beings. These people slander whatever they do not understand and the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, it will destroy them. Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for the prophet into Balaam's heir. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Wow. Okay. And so the uh, New Testament offers often when they were dealing with false doctrine or they were dealing with people that obviously were not on the Lord's side would bring it back to the story about Korah. Because although they were family, they were not spiritual family. And so, looking back in this passage, and actually a, a great passage Jesus brings up, I think is applicable in Matthew chapter 7. He says that when the wolves come into your flock dressed as sheep in wolves' clothing, you will know them by their fruit. At the end of the day, the easiest way to determine what is true and what is a lie is the fruit. It's a fruit inspection. A good tree does not produce bad fruit. A bad tree does not produce good fruit. And you're going, wow, that's rough. But that's reality. When God is working through someone's life, it's going to produce good fruit and change. 
The Holy Spirit does not work evil. The Holy Spirit does not work sin. The Holy Spirit works a life change. It comes into a person's life and that person is born again. And the fruit of death is your old man, but the fruit of life is your new man. And there is a battle initiated on day one when the Holy Spirit comes to re reside in you. And that's a battle between your flesh and His Holy Spirit. And as you let that Spirit win, the good fruit just comes, comes rolling in. You go, where's my fruit? I say, where's your surrender? You know, the fruit of the Spirit is love. I love love. <laughs> of all the things that is easy, I think we all understand, it's love. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all these kind of things. Joy, sometimes someone says, you just got to be happy because the Holy Spirit, you know, would be happy. Sometimes it's hard. Yeah. You're like, man, tell someone to be happy when they're sad. That's rough. <laughs> when those two sons of Aaron died, God said to Aaron, I don't want you to mourn for them. Wow. Don't show on your face your grief because what your sons did was wrong. You'll get your time and place. But love. When someone says, man, you just need to turn up your love. Man, my wheels get turning. I'm like, wow, how can I demonstrate love here? What would love do? I like love. I mean, I love love. It's just, it's just the magic. You want to know what's the magic? What's the easy course? Love. Just love people. Love yourself. That's a hard one for the women. Men love themselves all the time. They get so lovey of their self, they get prideful. And then they got another sin to deal with. <laughs> but, but the women I've interacted with, and, and they struggle with loving themselves. And then when a man beats them down, it just confirms the own self-hatred they have. So... What was the plan that God really had for these Korah people? This is the beauty of this. this I'm, I, like I said, I'm crushing a lot of stuff into one thing, and I'm sorry for that. God had plans for Korah's family. The ark was not always going to be on the move. There was going to come a time when a man named David was going to stand up and say, Lord, I want to place a, you in a, 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 a structure. I, I want to worship you in a temple. And I want you to have a place where we can honor you. And God's like, you can't put me in a building. You, the ark never really contained me. Lord, I know, but, 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 you know, all the other nations, they worship their God from these fantastic places, and we put our God in a tent. It's a disgrace. And the Lord says, you know what? I'll honor the fact that you want to stabilize uh, this tabernacle and make a temple, but not by your hands, David. Your hands are full of blood. And so... God says, you know what? I'll let this happen. It's actually part of God's divine plan. It has to do with all these prophecies and what he wants to do. And, and, and a later event when his son will stand up in the neighborhood of that temple and say, you can knock this thing down in three days and I'll rise it up again because the temple becomes the heart and the life of every believer. And so, you know, God is building a theology from the ancient of days all the way to the present. And in that theology, he's always kind of adapting it and changing it. And so at this point, the, the, the wandering tabernacle becomes the established temple. But what happens to the crew? What about the guys who were carrying the tent pegs and the ropes and the sheets and the, did all the work? What about the, the Levite crew? What happens to them? What, what's their job? And we find the answer to that in, in uh, First Chronicles because it's the days of David and David's dealing with this issue. And in First Chronicles 6.31, it says, These are the men David put in charge of the music. In the house of the Lord, after the ark came to rest there, they ministered with music before the tabernacle, the tent of the meeting, until Solomon built the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, the permanent structure. They performed their duties according to the regulations laid down for them. Here are the men who served, together with their sons, from the Kohathites. Right there. These sons of Korah. I, I, I don't know if you're quite getting it yet. He gives the sons of Korah these jobs. In another place in 1 Chronicles chapter 9 and verse 18, it says, The Korahites, 
it labels them instead of the Kohathites, it's the Korahites, were responsible for guarding the thresholds of the tent, just as their fathers had been responsible for guarding the entrance of the dwelling of the Lord. And so these guys were given new jobs. So one of the jobs was to be at the entrance of the gate of the temple. One of the jobs, he says, you know, you're not lugging things around anymore. You're not doing anything anymore like that. Now your job is to be the guy at the gate. And the other parts of the family of the sons of Korah, your job is to bring worship to this place. You are going to use instruments. You are going to uh, beautify the worship of God like it's never been beautified. You're going to bring out timbrels and you're going to bring out trumpets and stringed instruments. And this valley of Jerusalem is going to hear a praise unto our great God Yahweh like it's never heard before. It's going to thunder. And we read about the initiation of the temple when Solomon hits his knees and prays to God, and we see how wonderful it was. But the transition of the Levitical priesthood went from being this group that moved things around all the time into this group that led worship. They would be the ones that would lead people to God. They would be responsible for generating an atmosphere that would bring people close to God. It was as if the Holy of Holies, the veil had been torn. Jesus had paved the way for us. But music still helps people to enter in. I think about a time when Elisha, one of the prophets, he was uh, wandering around and he bumped into the two kings, the northern king and the southern king. And, and the northern king was like, are we going to succeed in this battle that we're going to have against these people of the east? And, and Elisha was like, you know, I wouldn't even talk to you. You're like Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't even want to talk to you. But because you're associating with the southern king, I will listen to what you have to say. He said, bring me somebody with a timbrel, like a tambourine. And when the spirit of the Lord moves upon me, I'll tell you what the Lord wants. Another place in the Bible says that Saul, he was, he was infected with a demonic spirit. And that when that spirit would hit him, they would call for David, who was a young boy then, and have David play the harp. And when David would play the stringed instruments, that demonic force would be soothed. And Saul would get back in his right mind and it would put him down. Why? Because the power of music, the power of worship, settles our brain and helps us enter into the Holy of Holies. It's so important what we do right here. It's not just three songs and offering and... This, this is our, our, our place of, of entering in, of, of breaking down the strongholds, of making the spiritual forces leave. And it's a plan God set up. You know, I hear churches that don't want to use musical instruments. And I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? Well, it's not mentioned in the New Testament. Yeah, but this is the whole structure. You, you, you haven't studied the Old Testament, apparently. This is the whole new thing. This is the way we're going. This is the way it works. No instruments. Man, when the trumpets come, when Jesus returns, that angel will be blowing a trumpet. Yeah, and we are a reflection on earth of the spiritual in the heavens. Yeah. Jesus, our high priest, has entered into the heavens. And believe me, those angels are singing. Oh, yeah. And so eh, music is so important. Matter of fact, I would think that music is having a greater impact on this generation than preaching is. Oh, yeah. I think worship leaders across the charts are having a greater impact on America, let me just speak for America, than our preachers in America are. That music, man, sometimes you get on that radio and you're listening in your car and you hear the right tunes and you're singing right along with it or sometimes you're crying, sometimes you're changing, sometimes something good's down in your heart and you go, man, Lord, I'm so sorry, I want to change, I want to be the person you want me to be. Yeah. Music is powerful yeah. and God knows it. And every example of music and instruments in the Bible is for positive, not negative. And so the concept that somebody would want to throw out music. There's churches, they call themselves the exclusive psalmody. We sing just the psalms and we don't use instruments. I'm like, apparently you don't read the psalms. Because they're full of instruments. Timbrels and tambourines and jums and dancing. Well, that was the Old Testament. And since the Aaronic priesthood is gone and we are in the brotherhood of all priests, that we do not need to be latched on to Old Testament concepts. Well, you missed it. You missed it. You missed the transition. The Levitical priesthood is over. We're all kings and priests. And we're all worshiping Him. And we're all door guards. And we're all sitting at the feet of the Master. In Psalms, if you've ever noticed it, and this is where I end, there are, I don't know, 12. 12 Psalms 
written by the sons of Korah. Not the sons, but we're talking 18 generations later. Okay. One, the one that I want to speak about, and then I'll stop and let you hear. The, the one that impacts me the most is Psalms 84. And the psalmist, a son of Korah, writes, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. So here was God destroying Korah and all those evil followers and the rebellion. But in Numbers 26, 11, it says, but the sons of Korah did not die. God left a remnant. God left a remnant of the descendants of Korah to live on so that they could be worship leaders. Wow. Which is an amazing calling because the priesthood's been removed. So here they were, in a way, lusting after something they couldn't have in the day they wanted it. But today they've been given it in a time when they don't want it. These songs David put together for me and they are all from, they are all built upon uh, the psalms that the sons of Korah wrote. While the songs are playing, I'm going to fulfill what I promised and have Jonathan come up here. I'm going to pray with him. Uh, sorry, I do that to you guys. Logan, I'm anointing him with oil. He's going to move away from us uh, in flesh but not in spirit. And if you would like prayer for anything, this is probably a great time. And our, Arthur and Tommy, if you want to wheel on up here and, and pray with me, that would be awesome. So again, Logan's going to come up. I'm praying for him because he's moving. And uh, he's a part of Acorn. And, and he's going to be off in school. And he'll be under all the pressures of, of being distant and not protected from us. We're, we've prayed and hopefully successfully found him another assembly to be part of while he's there. And we feel confident that they'll take good care of him. But I still think it's important to pray for him. But at the same time, if you have needs and prayers that you would like to address, uh, why not now? <laughs>